Tonight, the deadly mass shooting at a Georgia high school. Four people killed, two students and two teachers, nine others injured. The terrifying moments inside classrooms as gunshots rang out. Some barricading themselves, chaos and confusion as hundreds sheltered on the football field. The suspect, a 14-year-old student confronted by a school resource officer, then giving up. Also tonight, the federal indictment of two Russians accused of being foreign agents trying to influence U.S. opinion ahead of the election. Vice President Kamala Harris in New Hampshire, her new pitch on the economy, and what the Harris campaign just revealed about its demand to change the debate rules. New protests in Israel and new defiance by Prime Minister Netanyahu facing growing pressure to end the war in Gaza and secure the release of the remaining hostages. Our NBC News poll of Gen Z voters where they stand on Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, plus why so many say they are putting off important life milestones. The impact on college campuses a year after the Supreme Court limited the use of race in admissions. How the number of black students has changed at some school. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. How many times have we seen it? The images of kids racing from their classrooms in horror. Those chilling early reports of an active shooter followed by the inevitable wait to know how bad is it this time. Tonight in Winder, Georgia, the search to make sense of the senseless begins at Appalachie High School, where two students and two teachers were murdered today, nine others injured. The suspected lone shooter, a 14-year-old male student in custody after surrendering to police. After a hard lockdown was lifted, students were led outside to a ball field where they were reunited with their families. The school year in Winder, barely a month old when tragedy struck today. Officials say the shooter has been interviewed by authorities, but tonight, no word of a possible motive. Priya Shreether is there tonight with the latest developments. Horror in Winder, Georgia, after officials say a suspected shooter opened fire in Appalachie High School. A 14-year-old student here at the high school. Again, he has been taken into custody. Uh, he, is, he will be charged with murder and he will be tried as an adult. This video capturing terrifying moments after gunfire rang out. Police say deputies and emergency medical personnel rushed to the high school at about 10.23 a.m. in response to an active shooting. The school put on lockdown. It was just like a loud boom. Authorities say the gunfire left four dead, two teachers and two students, and nine injured. Our school resource officer engaged him, and the shooter quickly realized that if he did not give up, that it would end with an OIS, or an officer involved shooting. He gave up, got on the ground, and the deputy took him into custody. Golf coach David Phoenix was shot twice and is alive, according to his daughter, who posted on Facebook that he's in stable condition. My heart hurts for these kids. My heart hurts for our community. But I want to make it very clear that hate will not prevail in this county. Love will prevail over what happened today. Students returned back to school in August, sophomores describing the terrifying moments. I didn't know what was going to happen because you could hear the gunfires right down the hall. So I was shaking, scared. Yeah, I thought I was going to die. Student Itzel Navarretti says she was shaken up and scared. How does it feel that this happened at your high school? I'm shocked. I'm shocked something like this could happen here. <laughs> Panicked parents rushed to the school, later reuniting with their children at the football field. Um, my daughter called me at work, um, screaming that there was a shooter at Appalachie. President Biden briefed today, writing, Jill and I are mourning the deaths of those whose lives were cut short due to more senseless gun violence. Former President Trump posting, these cherished children were taken from us far too soon by a sick and deranged monster. At a rally in New Hampshire, Vice President Harris remarking, It's senseless. It, it is. We've got to stop it. And we have to end this epidemic of gun violence in our country once and for all. And Priya, have investigators reached out to the suspect's family yet? That's right, Lester. Authorities have spoken to the suspect's family, but they say the investigation is ongoing. School here is closed for the rest of the week. The community is gathering tonight for a vigil to mourn the victims.
Lester. All right, Priya Shreeder, thank you. Also tonight, the U.S. hitting Russia with new sanctions for trying to manipulate U.S. opinion ahead of the election by spreading propaganda online. Here's Stephanie Gosk. With two months to go before the election, the Biden administration says it is cracking down on foreign countries trying to influence opinion in the U.S. The target today, Russia. The DOJ announcing the seizure of 32 internet domains used or sponsored by the Russian government, it says, to spread bogus news stories. These websites were designed to appear to American readers as if they were major U.S. news sites. The DOJ also indicting two employees of the Russia-funded media company RT, which was banned in the U.S. following the invasion of Ukraine. Since at least last year, RT has used people living and working inside the U.S. to facilitate contracts with American media figures. The two Russian nationals are accused of running a $10 million scheme to fund and direct a U.S. company producing videos, mostly directed to the publicly stated goals of the Russian government, according to the indictment. It comes a day after former New York State employee Linda Sun pleaded not guilty to taking millions from China in exchange for influencing top levels of the New York State government. Well, the moment we discovered the misconduct, we fired this individual. I am furious. I'm outraged by this behavior. The couple allegedly living a lavish lifestyle with multi-million dollar homes, luxury cars, and expensive gifts. The Department of Justice says that she was a threat to our national security. In what way? Well, agents of influence are subtle. They're difficult to see. While they don't steal secrets, they can alter information. The U.S. government says it's not just China and Russia, but also Iran. And their efforts to influence the election are only ramping up. The Justice Department's message is clear. We have no tolerance for attempts by authoritarian regimes to exploit our, demogra our democratic system of government. And Stephanie, join me here in the studio. Did officials yeah. disclose that this foreign interference is impacting one party more than the other? U.S. officials didn't say for sure, but they did say that Russia's trying to undermine Kamala Harris, Iran's trying to undermine Donald Trump. The message for American voters, pay attention to where you are getting your information now more than ever, Lester. Okay, Stephanie, thank you. Now to the race for the White House and Vice President Harris proposing tax relief for new small businesses. Plus, the Harris campaign relenting after demanding changes to the debate rules involving muted microphones. Gabe Gutierrez is in New Hampshire tonight. Riding a wave of Democratic enthusiasm, but under pressure to detail her policies, today Vice President Harris unveiling new proposals on a top issue for voters, the economy. It's essentially a tax cut for starting a small business. Harris proposing a series of new benefits for small business owners, including up to a $50,000 tax deduction for startup expenses, 10 times what's currently allowed. And she wants a smaller increase to the capital gains tax than President Biden called for. Compare that to what Donald Trump plans. He plans to give billionaires massive tax cuts and to cut corporate taxes. But her plans would need congressional approval. That's partly why Harris is in blue New Hampshire, where her campaign hopes her surging candidacy will rub off on Democrats running for Congress. Still, polls show voters trust former President Trump more to handle the economy. This is the lie at the heart of Kamala Harris's campaign, that if you elect her, she's somehow going to be different than she already has been in office, where her policies have caused higher grocery prices, higher food prices, and, of course, a wide-open southern border. For voters here, the differences are stark. We met small business owner Brad Smith, who thinks Harris brings hope. Do you think that your small business is better off now than it was during the Trump administration? Oh, without a doubt. And I, and I think the reason is everything to do with optimism. Um, if you're a doom and gloom candidate or president, you are not going to start a business. Chad Kozdra thinks otherwise. Yeah. I, I just, I don't trust her. He owns a barber shop in Portsmouth and says he'll vote for Trump. I think he did a pretty good job. Harris is just going to be four more years of misery. Meanwhile, two Harris campaign sources tell NBC News they've just agreed to the final rules for next week's debate, including muting the mics when it's not a candidate's turn to speak.
Lester. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. After four days of mass protests by Israelis demanding a deal to free the hostages in Gaza, Prime Minister Netanyahu held a defiant press conference tonight. It comes as we're learning the U.S. is considering its own deal with Hamas to free the American hostages. Our Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv. Raf, what more do we know? Lester, five sources tell NBC News that a direct deal between the U.S. and Hamas is not likely and no formal offer has been made, but it is being considered and it comes as the White House is under intense pressure from the families of U.S. hostages and is losing faith in Netanyahu. Night after night, Israelis taking to the streets demanding their prime minister make the concessions needed to reach a hostage deal. But tonight, an embattled yet defiant Benjamin Netanyahu declaring he won't withdraw troops from the Egypt-Gaza border, known as the Philadelphia Corridor. Gaza must be demilitarized, and it can only be demilitarized if the Philadelphia Corridor remains under firm control. The corridor is a major part of the stalemate in ceasefire talks, and Israeli forces waited until May to take control of it. If the Philadelphia Corridor is so critical as you say, why is it you left it seven, eight months into the Israeli ground offensive before seizing it? Well, it was critical also to destroy Hamas, to kill about 20,000 of their, uh, of their uh, uh, operatives. This was the uh, military plan that the military and the political echelon agreed upon. Public fury over Hamas's killing of these six hostages and the Israeli government's failure to save them. Among the dead, 27-year-old Almog Sarusi. The mother of Almog Sarusi, one of the murdered hostages, says you sacrificed her son on the altar of the Philadelphia Corridor. If the price of your refusal to withdraw from the Egypt-Gaza border is more hostages are killed, is that a price you are prepared to pay? And is that a price the people of Israel will accept? I can understand the internal, the great torment that the mother of this murdered hostage feels. I'm committed to getting all of them out. Neither the prime minister nor the protesters backing down. Raf Sanchez, NBC News, Tel Aviv. In 60 seconds, how young people are viewing the choice between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. And what concerns them most as they prepare to vote, our rare poll of Gen Z voters is right after this. We want to circle back now to the election now with a rare poll of the nation's youngest voters, Gen Z, weighing in tonight on the issues that matter most to them. Here's Savannah Sellers. I'm very proud to be an American. 21-year-old Oglethorpe University student Ashley Ewald says when Vice President Kamala Harris entered the race, it changed the game for her and many other young voters in swing state Georgia. I'm hearing, I'm excited to cast my vote. I literally heard that from somebody who wasn't going to vote in November. Tonight, a first-of-its-kind NBC News Stay Tuned poll of 18 to 29-year-olds shows Harris leading with registered Gen Z voters like Ewald. 50% said they favored Harris, while 34% backed former President Donald Trump. I think he's the best man for the job right now. At nearby Kennesaw State University, 21-year-old Grayson Hilliard says he's having trouble making ends meet. He thinks Trump is the one who can fix that. And I think a lot of us are struggling at this time and we need help. When you say you're struggling, what things feel tough? Grocery shopping for sure. Definitely noticing having to budget a little bit more at the grocery store, picking up the off-brand item, definitely picking up overtime at work, bought an electric car to save money on gas. Um, that extra $40 goes a long way each month. In the poll, 31% said cost of living and inflation is what matters most in this election, with 68% saying they've delayed important life milestones like buying a car or home due to debt. How do you feel about the potential of being able to be a homeowner? I'm worried. I don't think that the way the prices are right now, um, I'd ever see myself being able to afford a home or own one. As for the VP picks, 55% in the poll said they view Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as a positive choice. As a Republican, that worries Hilliard. I think that he is a great pick for Kamala Harris. He's that small town dad seeming vibe. Um, and that does appeal to a lot of voters. 32% said they have a positive opinion of Senator J.D. Vance. As you see him interacting with everyday people, it's a little awkward. All the memes are saying this phrase, weird. And I think that when he speaks to people, you could see it. 
One area of agreement for Hilliard and Ewald, setting a maximum age limit on who can run for president. 73% in the poll share that opinion. Do I want my grandmother to be in office right now running the country as a 78 year old? Absolutely not. She should be at the beach having fun, you know? She should be making cookies for her grandkids, you know? They also share a commitment to voting in November, knowing the election could come down to Georgia. I kind of wear it as a badge of honor to be in a state and also be organizing and mobilizing in a state that is such a battleground state like Georgia. All eyes are on Georgia again. Savannah Sellers, NBC News, Atlanta. Still ahead as we continue here tonight, our reporting on how that landmark ruling to end affirmative action is impacting the incoming classes at American Modest colleges. The policy of race conscious admissions was. We're back now with the new fallout from last year's Supreme Court ruling ending affirmative action in college admissions. Tonight, Laura Jarrett takes a close look at how schools are now handling decisions about diversity. The schools say they saw it coming. We have to be open and honest about what's happening. A noticeable drop in the number of incoming black freshmen at some of the nation's top universities. The first class admitted after last year's decision from the U.S. Supreme Court sharply limiting the use of race in college admissions. Something Mount Holyoke College President Danielle Hawley says ushered in a sea change. That demographic information that used to be readily in students' file is now masked. When we get that data now, the data does not have race data attached to it. It's so not there's even, no way. It's not no. even there. It's no. just blank. That's right. So there's no way for readers to know. That fundamental shift in admissions now emerging in early data from several elite schools. Today, Yale revealing its share of black students remains steady compared to 2023. But at MIT, black students dropping 10 percent. And at Amherst, black students dipping by 8 percent. The primary cause of the dips in enrollment? Not easy to pinpoint. Some schools say delays in processing financial aid offers prompted students without means to look elsewhere. It was a perfect storm. In the wake of the high court's ruling, some have turned to other ways to reach students of color, relying on more pipeline programs and coordinating with underserved high schools. It has made our work more difficult. It really has. The admissions team at Sarah Lawrence College decided to offer an optional essay giving applicants a chance to respond to the Supreme Court's decision. There's some remarkable responses in there. We're a liberal arts college. We want our students tackling big real world issues, and this is a big real world issue. The school now says incoming black students have actually increased from four to six percent. Still, the ruling has complicated admissions for top colleges that say they want to diversify an historically white student body. But it's also served as a long fought victory for those who've argued it was unconstitutional for schools to give any preferential treatment based on race. Are there some students, faculty, or even peers that say to you, you know, I actually think the Supreme Court got it right? Oh, absolutely. There are race neutral methods. People like Edward Bloom, the architect behind the original lawsuit accusing Harvard and UNC of giving a boost to black applicants and discriminating against Asian students. We just don't know what Harvard and UNC and most colleges and universities have done. Until that data is released, we're just going to have to wait and find out. For Bloom, the work is not done, as he's now focused on what's happening in graduate school admissions and beyond. Your race and your ethnicity doesn't tell us anything about who you are as an individual. Now, most schools, Lester, still have not released their data for this year's freshman class, but we do expect to see those figures start to come out in the coming weeks. A fascinating follow-up. Follow Thank you. And that is nightly news for this Wednesday. Thank you for watching. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.